This movie was inspired by Justin Kessler's postcard collection of Vacation Valley. Vacation Valley was once a phrase used by the Catskill Mountain News to describe the Big Indian Oliveria Valley. Through Justin's postcards, we can take a peek at a bygone era when resorts dotted the valley. My name is Chris Van Cleek, and I am the historian at Winnesa Club, and with Justin's blessing, made this movie based on his postcard collection. I also received the love and help of Kathleen Myers, who is the curator of the Shandaken Historical Museum in Pine Hill. To understand how this beautiful valley became a magnet for tourists, we need to travel back before the resorts became popular. What we now call the Village of Big Indian was once called the Clove. In 1865, the village was renamed Big Indian after a Munsee Indian named Winnesook. Winnesook lived and died in the area in the 1700s and was seven feet tall, hence the name Big Indian. Who knows for sure, but maybe the residents of 1865 felt the name and mythology of Winnesook was a more charming name for their village. But what transformed this remote area to what was eventually called Vacation Valley? First and foremost, the Big Indian train station was built in 1871. By the way, taking a vacation was an unheard of concept until the 1880s, so the railroad had to convince New York City dwellers to come to the Catskills to rest. The second factor that brought tourism to the valley was the popularity of Slide Mountain. Hiking was a popular health craze at the time, and when Slide was deemed the highest mountain in the Catskills, city dwellers had to get to the summit of Slide. Interest in Slide was also strongly influenced by author John Burroughs' brilliant descriptions of the beauty of Slide Mountain. As a result, New York residents rode the trains to hike Slide and summer tourism exploded in Big Indian and Oliveria. Local homes were turned into boarding houses and resorts of all sizes were built. When tourists stepped off the train in Big Indian, the first thing they saw was this general area. Now let's superimpose buildings that were there around 1900. We can see Bryant's store, Lament's Hotel, and Ailey's General Store. Later, the scene looked like this. This is Archie Ailey selling coffee to a customer around 1950. This 1920s postcard shows another view looking up Oliveria Road with Bryant's store on the left. Now let's go up Oliveria Road and see how Justin's postcards give us a view of the old resorts of Vacation Valley. A few moments up the road and we see this building on our right. 
Let's compare this modern black and white photo to a photo of the same building from around 1900. As mentioned earlier, in the early 1700s, there was a Native American named Winnesook. Winnesook and Gertrude Molyneux lived together in the area of today's Big Indian Post Office. After Winnesook died, Gertrude and her family lived near the burial site, and generations of Molyneux followed. By 1887, descendants of Winnesook and Gertrude opened a boarding house called the Molyneux. It served tourists who were getting off the train at the Big Indian Rail Station. As you can see in this 1923 postcard, the Molyneux House eventually became a hotel called the Madorn. This is from 1947. These images were taken from the railroad tracks looking up at the Madorn. Notice the gorgeous porch that looked over the backyard and railroad tracks. As we leave the Madorn behind and take this familiar turn in the road, we come to this spot where we can view the Dunham Bridge of today and yesteryear. Now let's walk across today's Dunham Bridge. As we go down the road, we come to this intersection. The Jewish home and Casimir's Lodge were once resorts down these roads. Let's first take a look down Crookshank Road and see the Jewish home, also known as Camp Lehman. At the end of the road today is a retreat called Big Indian Springs, which was originally a hunting lodge in the early 1900s owned by Herbert Lehman. Lehman eventually co-founded the banking firm, the Lehman Brothers, and also became governor of New York and state senator from New York. The building and grounds have been many things over the years. After Lehman left the house sometime around 1910, Jewish women working in the garment industry in New York City would come here for a week's vacation. At that time, the building was called the Jewish Home. By the 1930s and 40s, it was called Camp Lehman. By the 1960s, it was a camp for ballet and sports. To attract tourists, pools like this one were a necessity in the valley. Some were built as early as the 1920s. Originally, these primitive pools were man-made lakes, made with gravel, sand, and concrete. Water was gathered from the Esopus. When the water had been in the pool for too long, it was replaced by new water from the creek. Of course, eventually resorts had modern pools with liners and chlorine. In days gone by, if you crossed the Dunham Bridge and went straight on Lost Clove Road, there was a gorgeous hotel called Casimir's Lodge. Originally called the Big Indian Hotel, the main building was constructed around 1892. In 1922, Steve Casimir bought the property and added a swimming pool which looked like this by the 1950s. Like many of the postcards in this movie, the images themselves are wonderful works of Catskill art. Many are carefully crafted paintings such as this one. Notice the beautiful rustic bridge, the old-fashioned tennis court, and the social building. Imagine the drinks and laughs in that little building. 
In the 1960s, the property was known as the Ashram. The Ashram was a Buddhist retreat led by Rudy. Saying goodbye to Rudy and Kazmierz, let's go back over the Dunham Bridge and up Oliveria Road and see what else we find. Just past this familiar sign on the right is what was known as the Elizabeth House, which opened in the 1940s. Later, it was called the Big Indian Lodge. By 1960, it was open year-round with three or four room cottages in the back of the main house. This was the recreation hall. Most of the local resorts had some version of a rec hall or social building where one could leave their room or cottage and socialize with other families. This was the swimming pool of the Elizabeth House. This postcard was sent in the early 1960s, so a natural pool without a liner and chlorine was still utilized. The back of this postcard depicting the pool shows us more about the Elizabeth House of the early 1960s. A few moments up the road and we see the sign for the Cold Spring Lodge. The original farm on this site was called the Cold Spring House and later the Cold Spring Farm. Look at how picturesque this property was. Unfortunately, this beautiful building burned down in 1934. The Bedell family built these rental cottages in the late 1930s. Let's go around a few corners past the Cold Spring Lodge and enter what was once downtown Oliveria. Oliveria was the surname of a family that settled here around 1860. As we enter Oliveria, the first building of note is the schoolhouse on the left, which is shown here in this 1890s photograph. Let's take a quick look at the history of the schoolhouse, which was built in the early 1870s. According to Laura Ailey, the state provided honey and peanut butter, which students ate by the spoonful while sitting by the potbelly stove. Firewood for the stove was supplied by the parents of the students. The Combe family took over the Slide Mountain Forest House in 1934. Ralph Combe graduated sixth grade at the Oliveria Schoolhouse around 1941. Let's hear a moment of my interview with Ralph about his days at the Oliveria Schoolhouse. I, uh, I went to grade, to grade school there, but I only went six years because it was a one-room schoolhouse and you heard everything that was going on. And the teachers say, Ralph, this sounds like you know all this stuff. You want to take the Regents exam? How many people were in that building going to school? Oh, changed. Yeah. At the, at the, in the very end, there were only four of us. Oh, my heavens. But we did, the last teacher we had was really, was a man. We had mostly women up until that point. He was a man, but, and he was, he was very good. But he also, if he saw, you know, the, the maybe should learn something else. He had us. We we all built a wheelbarrow. Oh, okay. I mean, stuff like that. I mean, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. how to use a hammer and. This is a collage I made to help us imagine 1890s Oliveria. We can see the three main buildings of the village: the schoolhouse, Dutcher's store, 
and the Mountain House. Dutcher's store looked like this in 1911, and as we close in, you could see the woodpile on the left, the horse and carriages in front of the store, and even the laundry by the Mountain House. Note how the road was only the size of a modern dirt driveway. It is a remarkable postcard that was hand-painted in Germany. This postcard depicts Dutcher's store in the 1920s or early 1930s. By the late 1930s, the store was owned by Sid Levine and is fondly remembered by many as a great country store. By the late 1980s, it was converted into a private residence, and in 2011, the building was destroyed by Hurricane Irene. It was finally torn down in January 2018. If we return to this 1911 postcard, we see the Mountain House, which was a hotel and bar. In the 1930s, the Mountain House was replaced by a new building called the Tavern. The photographer of this image is standing by the bridge to McKinley Hollow, looking down Main Street, Oliveria. This building here was the Tavern. The Tavern was a bar and restaurant owned by the Levine family and was a place to drink, dance, and get into the occasional fistfight. The tavern was a local favorite until its demise in the early 1970s. Before we leave our brief history of Oliveria, let's take a look north at what the old village looks like today. Almost all the buildings were destroyed by two floods in the 1950s and many more by Hurricane Irene in 2011. The brown house on the left was built in 1884 and was also once the post office. As we can see to the right, the old schoolhouse is the only other remaining building. The Oliveria schoolhouse closed in 1951. Beginning in 1956, the building became the last Oliveria post office and closed in the 1980s. The building is now a maple syrup factory. Here are two images of Oliveria from the 1920s and 1930s to help us say goodbye to a charming little piece of yesteryear. Now that we have looked at downtown Oliveria, let's visit a few bygone resorts in McKinley Hollow. Here we make a right turn over the Oliveria Bridge and cross over the Esopus and into McKinley Hollow. Here is what the bridge looked like years ago.
Straight ahead are three resorts for us to visit after we turn left and visit Brown's Bungalow Colony. This is our friend and postcard collector, Justin Kessler, standing by the sign for Brown Road. The Kesslers vacationed at Brown's Bungalow Colony from the 1940s to 1989 when Brown's closed. Let's go down Brown Road and take a look. Long before Justin and his family vacationed at Brown's Bungalows, the original hotel was called the Fairview. The Fairview began in the early 20th century. Maybe it was so named as it had a fairly good view of Balsam Mountain. Here is a 1920s postcard depicting a three-story Fairview Hotel that could accommodate more than 200 overnight guests. In its day, the Fairview was the largest hotel in the Oliveria Valley and was really quite an elegant place in the middle of nowhere. This is the upstairs dining room of the Fairview. This was the swimming pool of the Fairview, which was much more lake than pool. Note that the Oliveria Church is in the background to the left. By the late 1930s, the Fairview changed its name to the Oliveria Country Club and had a modern pool. Unfortunately, the top two floors of this massive building burned on June 13, 1945. Here is our postcard collector Justin Kessler's description of the events after the fire. Sometime in the years after 1945, Mr. Brown created Brown Bungalow Colony from the ruins of the Oliveria Country Club. The hotel's former first floor became the centerpiece of the bungalow colony and was known as the Casino, a gathering place where children put on plays and drank Cokes from the soda machine on the front porch. Brown Bungalow Colony, known by its guests as just Browns or BBC, consisted of a few fields dotted by wooden bungalows. The bungalows themselves were rustic and bare, with no phones, televisions, or other comforts we now associate with vacation living. A single telephone served the entire colony, with a loudspeaker in the center of a field from which the colony owners would announce incoming phone calls and other news deemed worthy of public address, like the availability of ice cream sandwiches in the colony's owner's house. Thanks to Justin for this great description. During the average summer weekend at Brown's, 120 people were staying in 42 bungalows. While the husbands had to return to New York City to work during the week, the wives and kids stayed all summer. A family rented the same bungalow summer after summer and would leave their belongings there during the off season. Plays and skits were performed in the recovered first floor of the original hotel, and this piano was recalled with love by the BBC community. Here is a home movie by BBC member John Cador showing the community in the early 1960s.
Despite the fact that the BBC has been closed for 30 years, the culture remains intact. They have reunions in the greater New York City area and have their own Facebook page full of sweet and sentimental statements about the old days. Finally, here is a 2019 picture of a refurbished Brown's bungalow. Thanks to all who helped me tell the story of the Brown's bungalow colony. It was a pleasure to get to know a few of the members and learn so much about a unique world in old Oliveria. Let's return to the bridge and go up McKinley Hollow to learn about three more resorts. To the left of my blue car once stood a beautiful turn-of-the-century boarding house called the Jocelyn House. The Jocelyn House was in business from the 1890s to 1919. It sat on more than 100 acres of woods and accommodated about 50 guests. As was true of many old resorts, the Jocelyn House had its own bowling alleys. You can see the fence in this postcard and how it was built of stone pillars and metal pipe. Here is some of the remaining pipe used as part of the fence and a few of the pillars. Hidden in the grass and trees, a few pieces of the stone and cement sidewalk can still be found. In the background of this picture, you can see the edge of the Oliveria Cemetery. As far as I can tell, 82-year-old George Jocelyn sold his boarding house in 1919 and the new owner called the house the Indian Glen. This postcard shows the road back to the Oliveria Bridge with the Indian Glen on the right and the cemetery behind the photographer. Most likely the building was lost to fire in the 1930s. Just past the old Jocelyn House and across the street was the Hedler Villa boarding house. As you can see, the porch of today resembles the old porch. Across the street from the Hedler Villa is the Oliveria Cemetery where St. Bartholomew's Chapel once stood. The last time the Catskill Mountain News listed church services in Oliveria was in September 1955. Their church was idle until it was intentionally destroyed in the mid-1960s. Before we go further up McKinley Hollow, let's turn around and look back down the hill towards Oliveria. This postcard image is from around 1900. Winter photos are so helpful as those pesky leaves are not in the way. Let's take away the red lettering and slowly take in the scene. Now let's turn around and travel up the hollow to visit the Mountain Gate Lodge. The Mountain Gate was opened by 1963 and closed after the devastation of Hurricane Irene in 2011. It was known as the Mountain Gate, Shangri-La at Mountain Gate, and Mountain Gate Indian Restaurant and Lodge. In its day, it was a secluded paradise, and by the early 1970s provided regular entertainment. In 2019, it was purchased, and this real estate listing describes the property. Now let's go back to the Oliveria Bridge and turn right. After a few more twists and turns in the road, we come to the Slide Mountain Forest House. 
This was the original Slide Mountain House, which burned down in the early 1930s. I love the old rowboat with flowers in it. The Combe family purchased the property in 1934, and the third generation is now running the restaurant, hotel, and bar. The Combe family have been here for over 80 years, and the Slide Mountain Forest House is the longest continuous family-owned resort in the Oliveria Valley. The Combe's charm and warmth make it easy to see how people come back year after year. This building was originally an annex to the Slide Mountain House and is where the Combies lived and started their business in 1934. I had the privilege of interviewing 89-year-old Ralph Comby Sr. and his friend Bill Burgess on the porch of the main building in June of 2019. That is Ralph on the left and Bill on the right. We sat together on the porch and spoke of what life was like here from the 1930s on. Let's hear what Ralph Combe Sr. has to say. It's a kind of a long story. My, my father, his, my grandfather was a, what they call a forester in Germany, which is like a game warden and, oh. and forest ranger, a whole combination. So my father grew up introduced to hunting. Oh. Uh, and he actually came to this valley hunting. They, they went to some place and then they didn't like it there. And somebody told them about Oliveria. So they came here, he, the mountains reminded him, he came from the Black Forest. The mountains reminded him of home. And that's how we ended up getting here because he liked the area. He and one of the other men and, and his wife and my mother and, and I, came on vacation in the summertime. And that's when he found out this burnt down hotel near the Johnson and that the property was for sale. Did, did it, was it common for so many German people to love it here because the mountains did remind them of Germany? Is that part of the draw? I think it was for a lot of people. It certainly was for, for my yeah, yeah. family. Oh. Where did your family move from, Ralph? From Brooklyn. from Brooklyn. My mother hated it, I'm sure. Out here? Well, we didn't have electricity. The only heat we had, I guess, was a kitchen stove. I remember my father saying sometimes in the morning when he woke up, there was, there was, your, your breath had frozen on the oh, blanket. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we all, they had feather blankets, you know, oh, at least. So if you stayed underneath them. But you didn't come out unless you had to. And that was probably then you had to go outside to the outhouse. That's why you got up. That's our place. I know. That's a beautiful postcard. Yeah, that's one of my, probably one of our original postcards. You figure that's in the 30s, Ralph? Yeah, yeah. We came here in 34. I guess 35 we started on a small scale and worked our way up from there. This is my, me and my wife, probably in the 60s. 60s, okay. We took over the business in 59. From your parents? From my parents. Yeah. It, it was altogether different. What we called a good customer came Memorial Weekend, came 4th of July, came for two weeks of vacation, came for our Oktoberfest. Gotcha. And they came for 20 years, 30 years. And it was their regular 40 thing. years. In those days, the people all tended to work for one place, like oh. forever. Oh. They always had the same vacation. Once they came here two years, they knew everybody that was going to be here those two gotcha. weeks. And they got to be a kind of a family group. They looked forward to, oh boy, we're going to go and we're going to see him and him and her. I mean, they, they became friends of ours, too. We'd go and visit some of them. And they, like I say, because they got to know each other, they'd get together in the off-season once in a while with each other. Right. 
Oh, like down in New York or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see. The Slide Mountain Inn was an original building, and the bowling alleys inside date back to at least 1898. This is Ralph Combe Jr. at the bar. And this is an event room upstairs and the pool outside the inn. Let's go right and travel across the Burnham Bridge and up Burnham Hollow. This is what the bridge looked like in the old days, and this is what it looks like today. After the bridge on the left sits the Alpine Inn, which began operation in the 1930s and sold in 2019 after it was run by three generations of the same family. Ralph has this to say about the Alpine. How long has the Alpine been around? Almost the same time as we. Yeah. Was all that built probably in the 30s as well? It was built, yeah, one after the other. Yeah. They... They started out, well, they started out of almost the same time as, as my parents. Yeah. But, but the two brothers that, that were actually here started to build up the place. They were very good friends with my father, you know, they, and they worked together a lot. Like if my father needed help with something, they'd come and help him, and if they needed help, he'd help. Just up the street from the Alpine is an 1850s farmhouse that once took in guests. It was called a Crystal Spring House and at a different time, the Mountain House. The original owner was Pardee Burnham, whom the bridge and the hollow are named after. It is not clear when the Crystal Spring House became a private residence. Laura Ailey offers this charming description of this boarding house. The title of her chapter on the Crystal Spring House is The Best Water in Town. The Crystal Spring House on Burnham Hollow Road in Oliveria was named because it had a crystal clear spring in the rear of the house. A three-inch stream of water ran into a small boxed reservoir. It was cold water, so cold you could keep milk or butter there that would never spoil. A cup was kept at the spring so anyone could get a drink of the clear cold water. Laney Burnham ran the Crystal Spring House for boarders that came back year after year to enjoy her wonderful cooking and clean atmosphere. Laney had a church social in her big yard in the summer. I can still taste the homemade ice cream and the delicious cakes. This map helps us see the Crystal Spring House, the Alpine Inn, the Slide Mountain Forest House, and the Slide Mountain Inn. It's a busy little corner of activity. Let's go back to Oliver Rear Road and take a right. You can see that the Catskill Mountain Lake is immediately behind the Slide Mountain Inn. Just after the lake is the Catskill Mountain Lake House itself. Let's bring up our Google map for an overview. These images show the entrance to the old Catskill Mountain Lake House today. This is what it looked like when it was first built, and it was called Shirley Cottage. The building was built in the early 20th century by Byron Dutcher, who named the building after his daughter, Shirley. As you can see, the porch is very inviting. This postcard shows the lawn rolling down to the lake when the property was called the Catskill Mountain Lake House. If we were to turn around, we see the Slide Mountain Inn at the opposite end of the lake. This image shows the entire property. It was quite an idyllic setting. This postcard was mailed in 1957. This postcard appears to be from the 1970s or the 1980s. Ralph Combe feels that Catskill Mountain Lake House became a private home around the year 2000. Between these stone pillars was the driveway to the Catskill Mountain Lake House. The dirt road is called Eagle Mountain Road and brings us to a beautiful place called the Eagle Mountain House. 
the property is so nicely perched on the mountainside. Here is our Google map with the Eagle Mountain House added. You can see it's just up the street from the Catskill Mountain Lake House. In 1972, a rock and roll band called the Fabulous Rhinestones rented the Eagle Mountain House and turned it into a recording studio. The production supervisor was none other than Michael Lang, who co-founded the Woodstock Festival in 1969. I contacted Cal David, who was a member of the Fabulous Rhinestones, and he gave me permission to play his song, Big Indian. Let's give a listen. Today, the Eagle Mountain House is a private residence. Now let's turn around and go back to Oliveria Road. You can see on the map where I circled the Brenner Haven Brookside Cottages, which is our next point of interest. George Brenner and his wife created Brenner Haven sometime in the 1950s. George was a retired New York City policeman. This is the only image I could find of Brenner Haven. It is a 1960s clip from the Catskill Mountain News. George Brenner and other cottage owners were petitioning Governor Rockefeller to allow state trails to be open for hunting purposes. The building itself was the recreation hall shown here in 2019. Inside was a small stage for plays and picnic tables for meals. Future Hollywood star Arnold Schwarzenegger visited Brenner Haven in the late 60s when he first came to the United States. By the 1970s, Brenner Haven became Brookside Cottages. Ralph Sr. told me that Irish cops and firemen stayed at the Brookside Cottages. Here's what Ralph has to say. They, they were really good customers in my bar. <laughs> Quite often in the afternoon after lunch, by the time I went over to open up, they were already sitting on the railing and drink what I thought was enough for a day, <laughs> and they'd go home. <laughs> and sure enough, at 9 o'clock, they'd come marching in again and start all over. These days, the cottages are owned by Carlos, his two brothers, and their families. Finally, the movie Catterskill Falls was partially made at Brookside Cottages in 2001. It is a suspense movie. Let's travel towards Slide Mountain and visit what was once the Holland House. Today, the property looks like this. In the 1920s and 30s, the property looked like this. The Holland House was a dairy farm that eventually became a boarding house as well. It accommodated 60 guests and had a pool and a tennis court. At night, there was dancing with music provided by the Holland's daughter, Elise. This ad is most likely from the 1930s. If we go further up Oliveria Road, we come to the site of the Panther Mountain House, which was across the street from the main building of today's Full Moon Resort.
Panther Mountain House was built around 1870 by Jim and Mary Dutcher and accommodated about 45 guests. The property consisted of 100 acres of farmland. Around 1870, Dutcher built the first trail to the summit of Slide Mountain and led his guests up his trail to see the sights from the top of Slide. Jim Dutcher was also the postmaster of the Slide Mountain Post Office, which was originally in the dining room of the Panther Mountain House. By the 1890s, the Slide Mountain Post Office was across the street in this building that was more or less where the staff parking lot of the Full Moon is today. Unfortunately, on December 8, 1912, the Panther Mountain House burned to the ground. Soon after, Charlie Andrews bought the property and built a small resort across the street from the site of the Panther Mountain House and called it the Valley View House. By 1918, the Parker family purchased the old post office building and transformed it into a bar called the Wigwam. If you notice, there's a charming sign above the entrance to the porch that says, Camels go eight days without drink. Who wants to be a camel? Eventually, Andrews built a bowling alley across the street from the main building, which was transformed into a bar in 1947. Over the years, the Valley View House expanded greatly and was a favorite vacation retreat for decades. For the past 20 or so years, the Valley View House is now the Full Moon Resort, which specializes in country weddings and music camps. In March of 2019, I had the privilege of interviewing 93-year-old Miles Parker Jr. about the Parker property at the top of this hill. Miles called this hill the Valley View Hill. Up past this hill, the Parker family bought 3,000 acres of land in 1870. Let's hear what Miles told me. Well, the original guy, Miles, he had the sawmill, then he had a boarding house, uh, that uh, had 33 guests, and he had a, a laundry room and a chicken place and a huge barn, and a lot of, well, he had 25 guys working for him at one time. This is the Falls House with the sawmill left and back. The house and property were wonderfully kept. This is the inside of the sawmill, powered by two waterfalls. This is a 1904 postcard and an amazing photo. When did the, the sawmill at the Parker Falls retire? I think, it, I think the Falls house and the mill burned down someplace around 1905. The Catskill Mountain News published a great article about the Big Indian Oliveria Valley on June 29, 1956. The article comments on the beauty of the valley and how tourism was booming in the mid-1950s. To give us a feeling of that time, here are a few passages from the article. The Big Indian Oliveria Valley is a gem of the Catskills. It is a restful retreat bound to stir appreciation for the beauty of nature. Its breezes are cooling, yet there is enough summer sun to warm the vacationer. 
the vacationer's life is a leisurely one. By comparison to more populous resort regions, there is less regimentation and less professional entertainment. Each guest is free to find his own pleasure. The accent is on relaxation, easy to do when nature has provided as many beauties as she has in the Oliveria Valley. There is an old country feeling to the valley, of friendliness and comfort. The major boarding houses and bungalow colonies have been booked almost completely for the upcoming 1956 summer. Last summer, the season for vacationers was the best the valley has ever experienced. This summer promises to even be better with the opening of the Thruway. Thanks to the Catskill Mountain News for that great narrative. Little did anyone know that the Thruway represented the beginning of the end of peak tourism in Vacation Valley. By 1960, the ability to take a family vacation far from New York City expanded rapidly by the interstate highway system and by speedy and more economical airlines. Not to mention staying cool with home air conditioners. Most experts note that the tide is turning and that tourism is slowly returning to the Catskills. But it's hard to imagine the return of quaint little bungalow villages where the same families laugh together at the pool each summer. Thanks for watching this movie, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did making it.